I'm uh, Steve Wolf. I'm uh, <clears throat> with Virginia Commonwealth, Commonwealth University Center on Society and Health and a member of the planning committee for the workshop. And we've reached an inflection point. We're going to uh, switch gears here and start thinking about the role of policymakers and what they are looking for from models. In about 15 minutes, we're going to break up into small groups, and I'll give you some instructions about that after our next speaker. But to start us off, uh, we're going to hear uh, a presentation uh, from Gary Van Landingham, who's director of the Pew MacArthur Results First Initiative. And he is going to talk to us about the experience of Results First. And as I said after his talk, I'll give you more details about our breakout plans. Well, thank you, and, and it's a privilege to be here to talk about the, the work of the Pew MacArthur Results First Initiative, which, as the name suggests, is a partnership between the Pew Charitable Trust and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And we've really trying to deal with the question of the, the, the moment, which is how do we bring modeling into the public policy arena in a way that makes sense, recognizing the political dynamic that we're in. And the challenge, I think, is when we ask the question, what do policymakers want for, model, for models, is they want answers to their toughest questions in real time, uh, and they want it to be able to answer a wide range of questions. Because policymakers have to deal with a huge range of issues. And the challenge with modeling traditionally has been is, if all I can do is answer this piece of this question and you're dealing with this, how do we get you thinking along the lines of, there's something we can do other than what we've all re always done. Uh, and I think we all recognize there's tremendous inertia in the policy process. The budget process in particular is incredibly incremental. Uh, what gets funded next year looks an awful lot like it's what was funded last year uh, because policymakers don't have time, they don't have information, and they want to avoid political conflict. And so what typically is, once a program gets created, it goes on autopilot and it goes out to the agencies. People typically don't pay a whole lot of attention to what it's accomplishing, and it just sort of chunks on until some crisis occurs. But then when a crisis occurs, what people think about is, okay, what else can we be doing now in addition to everything that we're doing to try to get the inflection that we want to have. And what Results First really is trying to do is to step back and to ask the question, what are we doing now? Does it make sense to do these things? Are there other opportunities that research has shown to be effective? And then let policymakers do what they do, but do so in a much more informed way than what they've been able to do in the past. So our goal in Results First really is to bring the best information that's out there about what works into the policy process. We've been focusing on states for a variety of reasons, but to really equip states to answer questions in a much more comprehensive way than they've been able to do, and then to see this work grow over time, both in terms of its impact in states as well as the scope of what we're able to do and to bring modeling to them. Uh, the overview is, what we were doing with Results First is really identifying what works. Uh, and we've been using the works of national research clearinghouses in a variety of policy areas, and been using the work of the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, which has been developing a portfolio-based cost-benefit analysis model uh, for about the last 15 years. And we've been funding the ongoing development of this. This currently allows states to look at evidence-based interventions in areas such as adult and juvenile justice, child welfare, substance abuse, mental health, uh, early intervention programs, some K-12, and we're starting to explore the idea of, ide uh, of building this out into more public health oriented approaches to, to really help inform that. But our, our general approach is to start with the best research that identifies what works as evidence-based programs, uh, then do the econometric modeling of what happens if you do them uh, based on the effect sizes and recognizing standard errors. Uh, put them into a model that uses the same modeling approach to predict the impact of, of those a large variety of interventions using the same approach, the same econometric modeling, uh, and do that really using the same approach to try to give policymakers an apples to apples comparison of what happens if you do X as opposed to Y within this policy environment. So if you're asking the questions, gee, crime is going up, what are our interventions that, that could help us reduce recidivism? What do we know about those, those different interventions? What happens if we do them here? And to give them an apples to apples comparison and, and to do that same approach in different policy areas. So basically we use a national research base, we apply that to local population data uh, and let the policymakers identify how they're spending their money, what we know about those interventions and what alternatives they would have. 
This really is an econometric model. It focuses on return on investment. What do we get if we're putting money into these interventions? We also supplement this by asking the question, what are we funding now? Uh, doing an inventory of currently funded programs in the policy area, matching them against the evidence base, recognizing there's a continuum of evidence out there. Uh, there's programs that we have a lot of evidence on. That they've been looked at by randomized control trials, multiple jurisdictions, uh, very robust evidence base. There's other things there's decent evidence on. There's comparison group studies. Well, we don't want to just be able to tell policymakers, well, we can help you assess 10 programs when you're doing 40 of them. We want to be able to say, well, some of these are sort of promising programs. There's some evidence that they're effective. Some of these are promising to get you bad results. Unfortunately, there are programs that we know about out there which make things worse. And then there's things which are homegrown programs which no one knows anything about. But the question we want to pose to policymakers is, are you happy with putting half of your money into interventions that nobody knows if they're working if there's other things out there that we can predict? Now, that doesn't mean that we're advocating that don't do homegrown programs. It's basically, if you really believe in these programs, you've got good advocates pushing good stories on these, let's test them and subject them to the same assessment of what's going on to be able to really look at what we're getting for the best return on investment. Uh, this is sort of, of the type of analysis that this, this produces. Uh, it's looking, this is an assessment of community-based therapy for for juvenile offenders, and the best research shows that kids who go through this program have a, a number of positive outcomes. Crime tends to go down by about 22% on average, that's the effect size. Uh, but then linking that to other literature, we know that, that kids who go through this program are more likely to stay in school, uh, they're more likely to graduate, there's positive benefits from that because the kids are, will go out and become employed at a higher rate. Healthcare costs tend to go down because the kids both become self-employed uh, because they'll be high school graduates, so they're more likely to have health insurance, and they're less likely to show up in ERs because they've been doing bad things, so on average, they're, they're savings from that. Total benefits and these are present values, about $38,000 for the investment of, of $3,000, 11 to 1 return on investment, pretty good deal for a state, uh, we, which is good to know. But what we really want to do then is answer the question, what happens if you do this compared to other things that you could do? And so by, by doing this on a portfolio basis, we call this sort of the Consumer Reports Guide to Policymaking, because we're able to sort of look at these programs and rank them by sort of what the cost-benefit analysis is on these things. And we see that there's some programs which are fairly cheap, get good, good outcomes. There's some that are more expensive, good, good outcomes. And there's some that are fairly cheap, which give you terrible outcomes. Uh, Scared Straight, despite having its own TV show, uh, is a very good program if you're trying to increase crime. Uh, research shows kids who go through that are more likely to commit crime, more likely to commit more serious crimes than kids we leave alone. Because if you send them to prison for a day, it doesn't just scare them into staying on the straight and narrow. It teaches them, well, I could make more money if I did X instead, like the kid I'm here with. So basically telling policymakers, if you look across what we're funding now, there's some things that simply don't make sense. Uh, and this is our goal to do in as many policy areas as possible. Now, the model allows us to do a lot of, of, of sort of what-if scenario testing as well as this. And it has some, some functions which I think sort of ideally represented the best the best practices of modeling. Uh, so this is, ba is based on, I wouldn't say a Bayesian approach, but we run Monte Carlo simulations about 5,000 times, give a prob probability distribution of achieving a positive return on investment. But we're really trying to answer the question of what happens if you put money into this? What are the odds that you get a positive net ben benefit to society? So it gives policymakers sort of an investment risk alternative approach of, of looking at this. And if sometimes there are going to be political reasons why p policymakers continue to do what they do. Uh, our goal is to make it fairly compelling in terms of the presentation of this that it makes it hard to do bad policy because if you do this and you build it into the process, it, it tends to be difficult to ignore. Uh, where are we doing this? Uh, we've been testing this now for about three years. We're working now in 17 states across the country and four local governments in California. Uh, and states are in different phases of this. Some of them are, are really taking this and running with it. Uh, some of them, it, it's more tangential at this point. As you can imagine, this is an approach that takes some time to, to, to sort of build into a state. Uh, so the, our best state's been working with us for about three years. Uh, and there's a case study in the handout materials on New Mexico, which is really embracing this and is using it to, to really identify how they're spending money in a growing number of policy areas. There's a couple of keys that, that are our impact of this. So uh, it takes about a year to get this approach uh, initially operational in states. Uh, then they start releasing reports, and then states start doing things. And, and you can imagine there's sort of a 
an escalator of, uh, of states as they're going through this. Over the last two years, they've moved about $80 million in funding. Uh, this is both targeting new money coming into the system towards things that, that are shown to produce high ROIs and discontinuing programs which are shown to produce negative impacts or that wants to really work with them to sort of dig into it. Uh, states have determined that this may be a good program, but we're doing it so badly uh, that it doesn't make sense to continue because sometimes it's easier to start a new program than to retrain staff who have been faithfully doing the wrong things for the last five years. Uh, but that really is trying to pay attention to the fact that implementation matters in evidence-based programs, and we want to be able to focus on that as well and to sort of bring people to the idea of evidence-based governance is not something that's a silver bullet, it's a golden approach. Uh, so it is something that we are, are trying to educate policymakers and to build this into the DNA of their process. Now, there's a few things that, that are important in, in this. Uh, one is that th the questions that we're trying to address in our work is how can we spend the money that's in the system in more effective ways than what we're spending it now? And we're focusing that work on state governments because what states tend to do are sort of have a lot of real world impacts. Uh, so that has been where we are focusing our work. Uh, there are, are things that we think are important to doing this. Uh, we all recognize there are real challenges in bringing modeling into you know, the, the policy process. Our strategy for that is to put this work into the policy process as closely as we can get it because it's so hard to have outside people come into the policy process and to have impact because policy, the policy world has a lot of gatekeepers in it. Uh, it's very time compressed. Our strategy is let's find people who these policymakers already work with. And so we're, we're working with things like the budget shops and the appropriation process, uh, the governor's budget sh shops, the, the research offices in the legislature who already have the relationships that are key to impact and then providing the tools for these people to to build into their repertoire of, of, of assessment. Uh, we think that is so much easier than trying to do this from the outside in. Uh, these folks have to have honest broker status. They have to have the technical skills to do this. They, it doesn't take an army to do this because the work has been done uh, sort of on the outside of the meta-analysis of the research and the econometric modeling, but it does require some, some lift for, for the state. Timing is critical uh, to any policy process. Uh, the reports have to be ready when policymakers make their choices, uh, which again is why we're trying to do this from the inside out. Uh, if you build this into the budget shop, they know when policymakers have to make those decisions. And I think we've also had times where we issued a great report the week after a policymaker made a decision and not when we were shocked when we didn't have much impact. So we want to have that inside out perspective in doing this. And this requires a lot of education, as you can imagine. It requires education of budget staff that we're asking to ask different questions now. It requires education of policymakers. Uh, we're trying to bring a new type of tool into their process. So we do a lot of work and, and workshops with, with legislative staff and with governor's budget staff and with sta policy staff in the agencies. Uh, we, we do a lot of outreach to legislative members and, and to policy executives to basically say, here's the type of questions that you can answer now. Uh, and this, as you can imagine, this takes time. It's a challenging and term limited states because of all the churn of these people. Uh, but we think that this is an approach that can really bring modeling into the policy process and answer the tough questions they have, which are essentially what options do we have and what happens if we do these options? And then we respect that the legislative process and the policy process to go back. I think there's a few things that, that, that I would like to toss into the discussion that, that happened earlier about things that the field can do to make modeling easier. Uh, the way I think about this is that there's an evidence supply chain uh, that, that has to be there for modeling to really be able to work. We have to be able to identify what we know about these interventions. Uh, and unfortunately, if you think about the production of research and it goes through the process so it comes to the modeler's attention, there's huge leaks throughout that. Uh, as we know, uh, there's lots of evaluations that are being done. A lot of them don't look at outcomes. They could. Uh, uh, the ones that do look at outcomes frequently use underpowered designs, so you can't really do much with the results. Good outcome studies uh, often never come to the attention of people who could use them because they only go to funders. They don't go out to the research clearinghouses. They're not published for a variety of reasons. We all recognize the challenges of academic publishing. But I think that if we want more research about what works to be available, we have to start plugging some of those leaks. We have to come up with ways that 
if a foundation is funding a study or the government is funding a study, that study should be reported someplace outside of the funder so it's available to the, the broader population of, of policy wonks. Uh, I think that there's work that can be done to make sure that the studies that are being done contain the information necessary for modeling. Uh, one of the key things that we see in a lot of evaluations is, hey, this is a great program design. Uh, it looks like it's good. It'd be really know, helpful to know how much this thing costs to put in place in the field. Uh, because evaluators typically don't think to ask that question. They probably have that information, they don't put it in the reports. But then if you're looking at the research clearing houses and you're a program manager, one of the first questions you have is, how much is it gonna cost me to do this program? Uh, we need to come up with ways of making sure that the evaluations we're funding have the information that's gonna be so critical for putting these interventions into place if they look like they're working or not. Uh, so I think that there are things that, that practically can be done to to help raise the game of the evaluation community, make sure they're doing good research, make sure that research contains the information that we need to have to make, to make it useful in the policy world, and also to make sure that that information becomes available to us so it can help inform the models that we hope that will inform the policy process. So I've gone through a, a, a very complex modeling process and implementation process in as short a time period as I could. Uh, so we'll have a couple of minutes possibly for questions before we move into the breakouts if I've done this fast enough. I have a very quick, uh, short question. Uh, Kathy Bozzi, uh, Chief Health Officer, Dow Chemical, and member of the round table. You were illustrating the states where you're currently working, mm -hmm. and I uh, was curious how those states are selected. Are they self-selected, or you select them? And is this a plan for that to be contained to those current states or changed in some ways, or what's your longitudinal process? Well, well great question and one we're grappling with now. Uh, when we started this four years ago, the, the, the key question we had was, hey, Washington State's been doing this successfully for a while. Are other states interested in doing that? So basically, we did presentations at policy forums, not to, like the National Conference of State Legislatures, Council of State Governments, and said, hey, we're going to be doing this. Let us know if you're interested. And anybody who raised their hands, we said, great, uh, let's work with you. Uh, we've learned a lot along the way of doing this. Uh, we have a much more rigorous selection criteria now. Basically, we're looking for an invitation from the state with a high-level policy commitment, which is really a letter of invitation from the governor and presiding officers of the legislature, because we feel that's necessary to get the work that we're going in. Uh, we're probably going to triage our work in some of these states uh, to focus on states that we think are really primed to do this. We think it makes more sense to have exemplar states than to be in 50 states and, and 400 counties. Uh, long term, it, it's hard to tell where we want to go with this yet. Uh, we, we think this is where the field needs to go. And we think that the technology is available now. We think that the research is available now. Uh, and we're thinking about ways to, to, to move this field. And the way I sort of think about this, if you think about is, is modeling used in the policy process now, yes, it is in certain areas in, in every state. Uh, you go back 30 years when states were trying to figure out how much revenue they had, they were making straight line projections. And not surprisingly, those were often pretty bad. Now, every state's using sophisticated econometric models, REMI or IMPLAN or something like that, to figure out, well, how much money are we going to have if we change our tax policy, what's likely to happen? We can do that now increasingly on the spending side. If we put money into this program, what will happen? Uh, we need better research on that. We need to expand these models into more policy areas on that. But we can be, start to be doing this now. Uh, and my goal is, at the end of the day, you know, in hopefully not 30 years, but people will not think about asking, you know, putting money into a program without asking the question, what do we think is going to happen? What research is there that that's going to be happening? Because I, I have a limited amount of money. I've got big needs I need to answer. And I want to be able to make better choices on that. And we're seeing some of our best states asking those questions now. And that's what we want to be seeing happen across the country. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. That was a really interesting talk, and sorry that you had to, to rush it so much. But that was, uh, I think, getting us off to a good start. Okay, we we uh, have to earn our lunch. Uh, apparently, uh, mathematical models have shown that there is no such thing as a free lunch. Um, so uh, I want to just uh, orient you to how the breakout groups are going to occur between now and lunch. So if you pull out your agenda, uh, this is the stapled packet that you got uh, when you came in, and turn to the second page of the agenda. 
uh, in the middle of the page you'll see that uh, we have four breakout groups and I want to just take a minute to tell you where they are and the topic areas that they're going to cover. Um, group one, which is in room 250, uh, is going to focus on health risk factors. So things like obesity, substance abuse, smoking, and so forth. Group two, which is in room 118, uh, is going to focus on the natural and built environment. So that's going to focus on things like air and water exposure, transportation, housing, and so forth. Um, an alert to roundtable members uh, who got some materials that show a different room number for group two. The correct room number is room 118. Uh, group three is going to be uh, outside here in the East Court. That's going to focus on social and economic conditions, education, income, discrimination, social determinants of health. Group four in room 280 is going to focus on integrated health systems, uh, sort of looking at a broad multi-sectoral approach, community conditions and clinical services uh, more broadly. Uh, as I said, group three is going to be located in the atrium outside this room, is the only one that will be webcast. Uh, assignments uh, for the other groups uh, are provided in a colored handout uh, along with breakout group guidance, and I'm going to talk about that guidance document in a minute. Uh, you also should have a map that was uh, at the handout table uh, in your materials. And if you don't get any of these things, there are apparently are extra copies uh, out at the registration desk. Now, about these four categories, it's important for you to realize that they're intended simply to provide breadth to the conversations we will be having. Uh, but obviously, there is going to be a, a fair amount of overlap between these. And, and the planning group struggled with how to divide these into buckets. But this is just a starting point to frame our discussions. Um, staff will be around to help you find your way. Each group has been assigned a facilitator to lead the discussion and a rapporteur. Uh, in Virginia, we would just say a reporter. Uh, <laughs> who will report on the key themes identified during the discussion when we reconvene after lunch. Uh, a staff member will be present in each room to assist the facilitator and rapporteur. Lunch will be provided in the West Court, so look at your map to see where the West Court is. And at about 12.45, uh, you all should be headed to the West Court for lunch, and then we'll be reconvening back in this room in plenary at 1.15. So we have about an hour for these uh, breakout groups before you head to lunch. Now, one final point I'd like to make is to refer you back to your handout again to these, this blue discussion group guidance document, because if you're like me, you often sit down in these groups and wonder, well, what are we supposed to accomplish? Uh, there's details in there, but I would uh, draw your attention to a set of questions uh, or points to consider during discussion group on page two and three of that material which lays out three or four example questions if you're a policymaker or a researcher uh, who's coming to the discussion, and then a few more bullets if you're uh, coming from a modeling background about the kinds of questions you want to uh, be thinking about addressing during your breakout group. So with that, uh, let me uh, dismiss you, and uh, we will be reconvening after lunch to hear back from our small groups.